Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, I know it's a busy uh, week in Washington, and there are no shortages of events, and we appreciate you being here. I'm uh, Brahim Akulubali, a senior fellow in global economy and development, and the uh, director of the, the Africa program. Um, so we are honored to have uh, uh, the, the Minister Abderrahman Bele to share his country's experience on the uh, issue of uh, economic adjustment in conflict-affected and fragile states uh, in Africa. So the, this, they are the state of progress and uh, remaining obstacles, uh, as far as the Somali experience is concerned, will be very much appreciated. Uh, let me mention that the event is being uh, uh, co-organized with the uh, uh, the Doha Center, the Brooking Doha Center, led by my uh, colleague uh, Tariq Youssef. Um, so in terms of the issue of fragility, I think what's in, uh, important is that as we push forward on the no one left behind agenda, uh, global agenda, we have to be particularly attentive to the unique needs uh, of the countries classified as uh, fragile. Uh, the reality is increasingly those uh, being left behind uh, concentrated in those states. And by our estimates, uh, currently in Africa, fragile states account about, for about one-third of uh, those living in extreme poverty. And that percentage is expected to rise to uh, about 37% by 2030, or maybe 170 million people. So clearly, that's far from the uh, zero target that is set uh, by SDG uh, goal number one. Uh, but I'm optimistic that uh, state fragility can be addressed uh, but it will require a really rethink of the approach. Uh, business as usual, uh, I think, will not be sufficient. And it will require also really strong will uh, on the parts of uh, both the authorities as well as the uh, uh, development partners. Uh, so uh, on, on the approach, uh, some of the con conventional ones at least have had uh, the, 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 a mixture of uh, the following. Um, first, you have foreign troops that intervene to help keep uh, the peace. And then elections are organized with the objective of uh, 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 bringing uh, legitimacy to the authorities. And then in return then for foreign aid, the government had to commit to a list of, uh, a long list of reforms. Uh, but this has tended to ignore really some of the country's dire initial conditions, including even weakened uh, state capacity. Uh, in practice, however, what we tend to see, and this is not necessarily Somali's case, but just in general, Foreign troops quickly become viewed as intrusive. Elections divide rather than solve the legitimacy issue. And the, the reforms are so ambitious that before they get implemented, it takes a long time, and the next, cri the ne the next crisis uh, hits before anything gets a chance to get done. And then we think, oh, we've done all of this, but it hasn't yielded any outcomes. Uh, so in our annual publication, uh, Top Priority for Africa 2019, our experts have drawn attention to the need to rethink the approach uh, to fixing state fragility, including greater emphasis on local solutions and on private sector development. Uh, we'll get to hear what the, uh, the minister thinks of those recommendations. Um, and uh, in the uh, case of Somalia in particular, the will I mentioned earlier uh, is there. The government has shown great determination and political will through its roadmap uh, towards stabilization, recovery, and reconstruction. The reform aimed, among others, to address the high and persistence unemployment through targeted investment in infrastructure and finance and attracting foreign investment and private flows. Despite myriad challenges, the Somali authorities have made significant progress on the roadmap, but there are clearly obstacles that they cannot overcome alone, and it will require more support and cooperation from uh, uh, development partners. Uh, so this conversation today will be moderated by my colleague, uh, Raj uh, Desai. And by way of introduction, uh, Raj is a non-resident senior fellow with us in the Global Economy and Development. And uh, he's Associate Professor of International Development to at Georgetown University. Uh, he's actually currently working on a project uh, in, in uh, Somalia on how to provide access to, to credit uh, for small-scale entrepreneurs. Uh, and in that context, uh, you were actually in Mogadishu uh, right. not long ago. Yeah. So uh, you can bring that fresh perspective to the conversation. Very good. Um, so with that, please join me in welcoming both to the podium. Thank you. 
<clears throat> thank you all for, uh, for joining us. Uh, and we are very privileged to have uh, Dr. Bele, uh, who I think is, as far as I can tell, the first Somali official to visit Brookings in possibly over four decades. So uh, this is a pretty important event. Uh, Dr. Bele serves as the uh, Minister of Finance for Somalia, which is the position he's held since uh, March of 2017. Uh, he was Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation from January 2014 to 2015. And during the, his time with the uh, Foreign Affairs Ministry, he oversaw the reestablishment of bilateral and multilateral cooperation, as well as Somalia's re-engagement with uh, international financial institutions, in some cases for the first time in more than two, two decades. Uh, before serving in the Somali cabinet, uh, for over three decades, Dr. Bele worked as an economist, uh, then a manager, and ultimately a director in the African Development Bank. Uh, his last appointment was as head of the, the Department of Agriculture and Agro-Industry. He is a Wisconsin Badger through and through <clears throat> with uh, an undergraduate degree, an MBA, and a PhD in economics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And finally, as uh, proof of the saying that in science there is truth, uh, but in art, there is honor. I would also like to point out that Dr. Bele is an accomplished poet and an acclaimed songwriter. <laughs> Dr. Bele, welcome to the Brookings Institution. Thank you. <clears throat> so let me start with a very broad uh, question. Given uh, what uh, Dr. Kulabali mentioned about Somalia's state fragility uh, and in terms of the challenges with regards to economic stability, uh, rebuilding uh, state institutions, uh, what are some bright spots that you can point to uh, in terms of recent developments that might demonstrate some progress that is, uh, that is being made? Thank you very much, Reg, and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kolibeli, and uh, uh, for your organizing this. I think this is very, I'm, I'm very honored to be here, really, uh, to be among uh, uh, individuals who are all interested in fragility, and I'm sure given where we are. Some of you have written about this, these issues. <clears throat> now, uh, what, what is new in Somalia? Uh, I think uh, everything is new in Somalia because Somalia is coming, back, coming out of a dust, so to speak. Uh, I think we should be very candid and very honest with ourselves. Uh, Somalia, Somalia, there is no country that have experienced the fragility level that Somalia went into. And everybody knows, I'm sure, if uh, Somalia is uh, asked, anybody who has fragility is, is associated with Somalia. In fact, before I answer that question, uh, the, the word Somalia has been associated with negative, negative things. Uh, journalists will say when country is falling apart, Somalization of that country. I remember so, 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 Somalization of Cote d'Ivoire. When we were there, and there was a north and there was a south, so, so they, they said uh, Somalization, and and and, and I, have, I have I have heard many uh, use that term, use that term, but no longer, no longer. I think we don't want to dwell uh, the, with, uh, on the history of uh, the history, but uh, make use of the experience that we had. So, what is new? Everything that we have today is new. The fact that we are collecting taxes is new. The fact that. Uh, we know who is working for the government by name and by account number is new. The fact that we have been able to register our armed forces and we know who they are and we know their age profile, that is new, uh, all, the, all the armed forces. Uh, the fact that uh, we are interfacing with, the, with Somali people is, is new uh, and that they are trusting us is new. I think everything that we have is new. What else is new? The interfacing with the international community is new. Today, this afternoon, we have the first meeting uh, of round table for Somalia where a decision will be taken today as to when the decision point for debt relief is going to be. We are expecting the debt relief uh, decision point to be February next year. But today, 5 o'clock, right when I live here, there will be the date. So, so a lot of things are new, and most of these are positive. What is new? Uh, that, that question uh, covers a lot of things. Uh, what, what is new? Diaspora coming back is new. With their skills and their money is, is very new. Uh, the mobile money that Somalia is number one in the world 
is new. All the money, every tra transaction is made through the telephone. Uh, if, if only brought by desperation, it's now becoming an uh, institution. So really, uh, we have a lot of positive things that we have to say. Positive things. Security is improving. Uh, the, the, the schools are improving. We are starting to, to, to build. Uh, people are going more and more. But there are also issues, challenges. Unemployment, things that are imposed by, by the fact that we are on a roadmap. Now, austerity program is challenging. So we have challenges, positive, but more positive than negative. Uh, speaking of challenges, um, so you, you mentioned the uh, increased domestic revenue mobilization yes. through uh, rebuilding uh, fiscal institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, a lot of uh, the progress will depend on uh, development assistance that so uh, Somalia yes. will, will need. <clears throat> Uh, so uh, can you say something about the process of re-engaging with the yes. international uh, financial now, institutions? Are, thank you, Raj. Uh, we are uh, in arrears with the international community, uh, the non-Paris Club, the Paris Club, and the IFIs. Uh, all of them. We have uh, arrears of about $5 billion. It's not a lot when you, when you see the size of the country, but it's a lot when we see our economy and, and where we are. Uh, those loans uh, started, we, we took loans in uh, 1965 to 1988. That's a long time ago. Uh, so uh, we, have to, we have to discuss with the international community on how to address that. There is a roadmap called HIPIC Initiative. That HIPIC Initiative, the, the highly, indebted, uh, highly indebted poor countries program or initiative, that's what, that we are on that roadmap. That roadmap tells you what to do in order for you to be eligible for debt relief. Now, we are on the fourth one, and that fourth one is upper credit tranche uh, compatible. And uh, upper credit tranche tells you that you have to have at least six months track record. The six months are going to end, end of, the, uh, end of December. So we are examined and, and tested, you know, there are benchmarks. It is just like taking a course, if I, if I may say so. So we are taking a course, and that course will have midterm exam. We had the midterm exam in September. Final exam is going to be December 5 to 11. And I attend all of them. I don't send any, I send a lot of people, but I, I lead the mission to show, to show the seriousness of this. Our prime minister is here today to also support, uh, show, show the seriousness of Somalia on the road, roadmap we are in. Uh, so we, uh, we are learning, we are learning a lot. And we have to graduate. We need to graduate because four, four years, it's more than enough, four years is more than enough, especially when you look at the challenges that we have in the country. Kids are graduating, no employment, and therefore supply to, uh, to terrorism. Uh, you know. so, so really, a lot of positive things, but we are not out, out, out of the woods yet. Uh, so this is a question that's related to the issue of rebuilding, um, yes. and it's a difficult question to ask because it has to do with the territorial yes. uh, integrity yes. of, uh, of the country. Yes. Uh, to move to a system of fiscal federalism, yes. which I understand is the intention, yes. you have these issues with the provinces yes. in the north, yes. as well as, obviously, issues of instability in the south. Uh, how is the... How is the government let, addressing let, uh, let me talk about the South first. Okay, of course, we were South and North when we got our independence. Yeah. North got the independence 26 June 1960, and four days later, the South. South was Italian, the North was, was uh, British. English, British. Uh, so we, they combined, and problems happened, and now Somaliland seceded. They, they decided that they, they will secede. And they are still, they are still saying that they, they, they will secede. Now, the South... Uh, there, are, there are states, just like here. There is a federal government and there are state governments. And there are always some frictions. You know, wh where do you see uh, a p a p a p a politics not having f friction? <coughs> and there is those frictions. It is uh, it's, it's a teething problem. It's really the teething problem. We now, it's a new to us. You know, this federalism thing is new to us. Particularly when all Somalis are the same. And you don't know what you are addressing when you are calling federalism. You know, the same language, uh, you know all these things, you know, the same language, the same religion and same culture, everything is the same from corner to corner. So you say federalism on what basis? You have to be addressing some differences, no differences. That is creating a problem, you know, uh, and it is a politi politician's mind to have a small government somewhere. It is not with the public. I can assure you, it's not. Having said that, uh, we uh, have decided to do so. Uh, we are discussing the way to harmonize things on my side, fiscal, fiscal side. 
the taxes will be harmonized, the laws and regulations that govern the distribution of funding, the distribution of wealth resources will be harmonized, and we are discussing those. But there will always be some friction here and there. I, I don't <clears throat> Now, coming to the issue of Somaliland, uh, the, the view by the federal government is that uh, we need to sit down together. We think that we cannot, it, it, it's to the benefit of nobody for, sep for separation of these two states, Somaliland and Somalia. And therefore, we have to give a dialogue and discussion uh, a chance. And I, I think that is what uh, uh, President Farmaggio is working on, to, to discuss, to sit down together, and to, and to heal wounds, whatever they are, to heal wounds. The world is combining. You have Eastern Europe, and you have, I mean, Europe, and you have other, others all get it together. We are talking about Horn of Africa combining, if that is, you know, possible. But so, so therefore, the issue of Somalia will not be, will, it is an issue caused by need uh, for resources. I am sure if that is relieved, if we start in the issue of development, if we start reconstructing the nation, if people can get employment, if kids can graduate and have uh, aspirations and, and opportunities, those other issues, political issues, will be resolved. Yes, frictions between the states and the federal government is something we are totally unfamiliar with in the yes. United States. <laughs> Uh, now, Somalia faces some very severe security challenges, obviously, yes, yes. possibly some of the most severe yes. uh, in, in the world. Yes. And in your own statements elsewhere, you've pointed out the need for, uh, for Somalia and for international authorities, yes. international development uh, community, to address the supply side, what you yes. call the supply side yes. uh, of the conflict. Can you explain what that means and, and perhaps yes. uh, uh, discuss how some of the accomplishments in terms of debt relief to all the other fiscal reforms as well as economic reforms uh, can help uh, address this supply side issue? Now, the supply side issue is uh, supply to terrorism is unemployment and desperation by kids. Uh, those of you who have been to Mogadishu, you go around and you see throngs of kids not having had opportunity to go to school, not having had opportunity to go, go, go work, they are all standing there, and therefore you give them some money and they, they can do anything. And, they, and they, most of them had the trauma of having seen their families, members of their families killed or, or some, some, some problems like that. So if we can find investment in education and investment in, in, in the private sector and investment in, in, in productive sectors and these kids are employed, then there will be no supply to terrorism. No supply to terrorism. That's what, what I mean. And therefore, building schools, uh, putting the curriculum together, uh, f facilitating for them to have vocational training, voc vocational schools. Uh, you know, 70% of Somalis now today are l younger than 30 years old. So it's, it's a youthful nation. And that youthful nation is full of energy. You have to manage and channel that energy to positive, positive things. Otherwise, energy does not stay, like they say in one spot. And that is why I say supply, su supply side has to be addressed. Supply side of terrorism has to be addressed by, uh, by, by managing the, the, the energy of youth, energy of the youth. Uh, let me ask one more question and, and then we can uh, turn things over to the, uh, to the audience. Um, so, uh, you know, before your service in the cabinet, yes. uh, you spent three decades yes. uh, as an economist uh, yes. and the African Development Bank and yes. various levels. <clears throat> Uh, where you provided uh, advice, technical advice, technical solutions to the problems of development, poverty, yes. uh, all over the continent. And uh, of course, as a government official, you've seen uh, on occasion how these uh, technical solutions run up against political obstacles yes. when it comes to implementation, yes, yes, yes. Uh, feasibility. Now, um, I, there are some young people in our audience who may be considering uh, careers in international development or maybe starting out. Yes. If you could uh, speak to your younger self, if, <laughs> if, if Dr. Bele, the, the, foreign, the finance minister, could speak to Dr. Bele, the young economist starting out, yeah. uh, what, what advice would you, would you give your, your younger self? That's a difficult one, right? <laughs> that's, that's a difficult one. I would, I would simply say that... Uh, you, you don't have a shoe that fits all. Uh, one shoe does not fit all. 
That, that's how, how I would say. I, I would say that because you are dealing with many, many, many countries. And uh, those many countries have different levels of needs, uh, different capacities, different outlook in life, uh, different rules and regulations. So if you have the mentality of taking your appraisal report to a country X and expect to do it exactly like you have in country Y yesterday, you will have issues, you have a problem. So what you need to do, even though, even though you are guided by rules and regulations of the institution you are working for, these rules and regulations are straight jacket sometimes, but you have to have that mindset. Don't be frustrated because this country is different than the other one. They are all different. They all will tell you, some, they, they don't want your money. Sometimes they will tell you, do not get frustrated like I did in the past. <laughs> uh, try, try to accommodate them in their own way. Try to be flexible with the institutions that you have. And, and uh, banks always have some, some flexibility somewhere. So that, that's, that's the advice I will give. But I will also say that you are in a, uh, in a very rewarding uh, uh, venture or, or, or a journey, I think, working for these institutions and going and traveling to countries and seeing the need for your, for your resources. Yeah, the need for your resources are also very important. It is relieving when you come to a, a dusty place and, and you assist farmers or assist schools to be built. You come back five years down the road and it is thriving community. It is very rewarding. So I, I would also tell my young men uh, to keep that in mind. <laughs> very good. Uh, so why don't we turn things uh, open up for some questions from the uh, audience. I will collect a few questions. I would ask you to... Uh, please introduce yourselves, uh, and in the interest of uh, time for everyone else, keep the questions relatively uh, brief. Uh, yes, why don't we start? Please, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I believe there's some microphones there, so this, this episode is being taped, so please speak into the microphone. My name is Steve Schwartz. I'm a former U.S. ambassador to Somalia. Greetings, Minister. Hi. Um, with federalism in Somalia being new and fragile, one of the shortcomings is a revenue base for the member states. Could you enlighten us as to what the status is of revenue sharing right now between the federal government and the member states yeah. and your relationship with the finance ministers of those states as well? Thank you. Uh, behind, in, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, my name is Patrick Kenyimbo from the African Development Bank. And first of all, congratulations to Minister for your post FDB role in Somalia. Uh, you mentioned that um, Somalia has been used as a word with a negative connotation. But for me, I know Somalia as the place where Mo Farah, the base British athlete, came from, Kanan, the Canadian poet. So it, um, Somalia has a lot of um, human resources in the diaspora. And my question to you is how, what are you doing to harness the diaspora community the Somalian diaspora, to first of all rebrand Somalia and to participate in this uh, uh, economic uh, transformation. Thank you. Let's take one more question in this round. Just, sir. I'm Ed Elmendar from the UN Association, formerly with the World Bank. In the 1980s, I had the privilege of raising many millions of dollars for Somalia and its adjustment programs. Very good. My question now uh, goes back to the introduction by Dr. Koulibaly about the importance of local solutions as, as one who tended to bring external solutions, particularly to Somalia's problems. I wonder if you could expand, Mr. Minister, yes. on the kinds of local solutions yes. that you are looking for and how that would change the dynamic of structural reforms which you experienced previously. Thank you. Why don't you? Okay, yes. very good. So Ambassador uh, has asked me about the revenue sharing. Uh, this is an issue uh, that we have been uh, struggling with. Uh, we have different states and we have the federal government. And the federal government, as the ambassador knows, is only in charge of the funds that come from the port and the airport and Mogadishu. Outside Mogadishu will be another state. It's like, like we are in Washington. So everything outside Washington will be either Maryland or Virginia or some other place. Uh, that is also the same in, uh, in, in, in Somalia. Now, therefore, the taxes outside the borders of Mogadishu is collected supposedly by another state. Uh, and we, we collect this. 
Now, we have not yet reached harmonization of the budget, which will have total revenue of the nation and total expenditure of the nation. We are working on that. We have, we have gone very far to say that this year we will have a summary of the whole budget attached to the budget of the federal government. Next year, 2000, uh, uh, 2000, uh, 2021, we will have a whole, the whole budget. This is what we are thinking. But we are still debating and discussing what we understand and we realize the importance of that. Now, sharing other resources that are not the local collections and the, the natural resource um, funds. For example, we know we have agreed on a formula to share whatever comes from petrol. Uh, we also agreed on how to share anything that comes from the ocean, the fisheries. We have agreed on that. The heads of all these institutions chaired by the president of the federal government have agreed that uh, the formula. And, and at one, stop, one point, in fact, we shared about a million or so that came from the fisheries. So natural resources, resources that are countrywide, we know how to do it. Taxation, uh, we, we are waiting for allocation of the functional allocation of government activities. What should be done by which state, at the state level? What should be done at the, one is that it's done, and that will be in the constitution, the constitution where we are. One is that it's done, then, then we will know who, who collects what. Diaspora is a very important positive element for us. Uh, diaspora, who was in the beginning refugees, right? But now are major resource for this country, for Somalia. Both uh, the skills that they bring, all kinds of skills that they bring, and, and, and the, the funds that they, they, trans uh, they transfer, two to three billion dollars a year. Uh, and though, so harnessing for us, they are Somalis just like us. They come and they are rebuilding, they are helping us rebuild the country. I am, I'm a diaspora. And most of the people working in the government, most of them are diaspora. No longer we are inside now in the country and our families, those who are willing came back, others are, are sending money. So it is really a very important component of our rebuilding, uh, rebuilding the nation. Local, in, uh, lo local solutions, yes. Local solutions, uh, we are very happy that we, are, we have one culture. We are very happy that before 1960, which is not very far back, uh, before that, we have had our ways of resolving things. We are also very happy that today we are together because of local solutions. Uh, we always say under the shade, under the shade of a tree. We, we know how the elders will resolve issues, and, and we, are, we are doing that. I am sure in the case of Somaliland and Somalia and the others, there's always ways of resolving, culturally rooted ways of, of resolving, and we are, we are using that to, to resolve some of the issues. In fact, what brought us together is cascading, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, so solutions that, that brought us to this. Thank you. Yes, sir. No, in the, in the front, and then I'll come to you in the back, yes. Go ahead, go ahead, yes. Thank you. My name is Michel Del Buono. I've been working on Somalia longer than many of you have been alive. And uh, until recently, I've done a few consultancies with UN, uh, the EU, the African Development Bank, uh, on Somalia specifically. Um, I think the I thank to thank the minister for his uh, brief summary of the situation in Somalia, but maybe ask a couple of probing questions. Uh, a very specific one, and just because it was raised earlier. I wasn't aware that the government had reached an agreement with Puntland on the division of fishing uh, permit revenues. Anyway, two or three attempts that I know of uh, over the past year or so failed. And that seemed to be a straightforward kind of argument. I mean, it, they even went abroad, was it, to the Seychelles to negotiate in peace and everything, and even there they failed. Anyway, what I meant to say, though, is that I believe the country is still in a lot of problems, especially on the security side, because Whenever the African Union forces liberated some areas, government did not follow. I mean, nothing happened. Uh, the services of the federal government were long awaited. Mm -hmm. And in part, the insecurity, in my opinion, stems from the lack of reconciliation at the local level. I'm thinking specifically of the Shebeli River Valley, where the farmers there are being tyrannized by armed people. Yes. Let's not say who they are, yes. 
but we know who they are. And uh, un unless and until there's reconciliation at the local level, how can you have a peaceful country overall? Yes. Uh, also, from what I understand, the mandate of the African Union forces may be on the exit side. I don't know whether Somalia will succeed in changing that. Um, also, I would like to ask maybe a question on the monetary side. At one time, I was an advisor to the Italian government on its aid to Somalia, and I very strongly voted against them printing a new currency. But that was some time back. I'm willing to reconsider now to see whether things have... At that time, there was no central government, and the new currency might have broken the Somali Common Market and Monetary Union, which is the reason I, I recommended against. And I'm pleased to see the Italians paid heed to my advice at the time. I also would like maybe you to give a quick, quick contrast between the achievements of the recently recognized government compared to the TNG, which was not internationally recognized. Thank you very much. Thank you. Gentlemen in the back row, and then I'll come forward. We should... Uh... Tony Coleman, former member of the UK Parliament and currently at the Columbia University Earth Institute. Um, I'm very pleased that Hargeza and Mogadishu are talking to each other. I've been to both places a number of times. I um, would want to ask one question only, if you'd be glad to know, which is the last time I was in uh, Hargeza, they were conducting a land survey on the basis of having uh, land title agreed throughout the area that was under their control. Uh, the government uh, in Hargeza felt this was very important in terms of uh, a land tax, very important in, t in terms of defensible space. It was moving away from, if you like, the tribal general ownership of the area, and it was moving forward that area into becoming a modern, successful state. Is that something, perhaps, that the Mogadishu government might want to consider, if you like, as being something that they might want to consider, because certainly it was felt in Hargeza as being very much the driving force to give stability. Okay. We have one question up here, the second row. Can you take one more question? Yes, yes. Hello, my name is Sarah Painting. I am a senior at Mount Holyoke College, and I'm actually here interning um, for the fall here in Brookings up in the Center for Universal Education in the Girls' Education Initiative. My question is, how is Somalia working to promote women's empowerment to help help economic growth, and more specifically, um, what work needs to be done to promote girls' education, and is this a priority? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one more question, third row. Right here, yes. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Nasra Ismail. I actually live in Mogadishu. Spent quite a bit of time with Dr. Bailey and the team. I represent civil society, international and national. Um, long before it was hip, Dr. Bailey, you did something that I think many of us on the ground knew um, was a new to the whole government. You started having public um, media come to your office and actually brief them on all the uh, policies and reforms that you're doing. So I just want to know if you will commit to continue to do that um, because it has meant that citizens are engaged. It has meant that people are aware of everything from debt relief to taxation, and we actually hope that you would actually um, make that a normal for the entire government. Uh, but we knew that that was something that you had started. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Good questions. Good questions. Let me try. Um, okay. Now, the issue of uh, Buntland and the relationship that we have with Buntland. I wouldn't say Buntland alone. Uh, we have five states and the Banadi region. And uh, we are working together very closely to resolve whatever dif dif differences we have. Uh, one good example will be now uh, all the ministers of finance met in Addis Ababa with the IMF, the World Bank, and the EU. Uh, we have also met separately ourselves. And we have agreed that we have one country together. I mean, there was no question on that. There was no question on that. It, is, it was a question of resources and sharing the resources. We have agreed on formula on the basis of which whatever comes from outside will be shared. We have earlier agreed, I don't know if you knew that, that some of the uh, taxes will be harmonized. And we have agreed and we have done that. Three, three items harmonized. 
We met in Gerowe, we have agreed, and those taxes are harmonized. We have also agreed that at some point, uh, all the customs uh, will be harmonized, the taxes will be harmonized. We now uh, agreed that the revenue bill will be one revenue bill, and that revenue bill agreed by everybody, including the Puntland that you have mentioned, will be coming to the, uh, to the parliament. In fact, on the 19th, it's going to the parliament. 19, with the agreement by everybody. So uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't really inject uh, too many issues into the, the small, small differences. We are one country, we are one nation, we have some issues, and all these things will be resolved when the, re, re, when the resources of the international community are unlocked. I can assure you that will be, that will be resolved. One country, one people, and, and we uh, agree on the major issues. Minor issues, there is absolutely no, uh, no more. Now, security issue, yes. I mean, I, I will not claim that Somalia has control of everywhere. And I have not said that. We have challenges. We are a very poor country. We are very weak in terms of institutions. We are seeking help from the international community. That's why uh, Amisom is there. And Amisom will not just move away. They are rich, rational people. We will look into it. It is better that we replace them with our own armed forces. The international community is assisting that we have a strong army to, to keep the security of this nation. But I will not, uh, I, I will not characterize it like, uh, like the government is not doing this or that. Government is not doing it because no capacity. Uh, I think that's the issue. And as soon as we get the, build the capacity, we will be able to, uh, uh, to, to, to control our, our borders, just like any, any other country. Really, we, we had some issues. Now, printing money, anybody who advises Somalia to, not to bring its own shilling, I don't know what the motive of that is, uh, with all due respect. A shilling is very important for us. As you know, Somalia has two, two currencies now. It has the dollar and the shilling. And the shilling is the lower de denomination. The, the, the dollar is anybody who has a lot of money will have a dollar, okay? But if you are going to buy potatoes and tomatoes and all these small, small things, you should have a shilling. That shilling is disappearing. There is a shilling there. It's disappearing. We are printing it for inclusivity nation. Uh, nation. Now, if you advise it, Italy not to print, uh, I, I don't know what your motive was. That but was a new currency, uh, Your Excellency. <laughs> Being done even even you can see if the country decides and there is a justification for it. Anyway, that, that's your view, but uh, the view I, I should uh, respectfully uh, uh, disagree. We are we are trying to print the first phase, print, renew the, the old old shilling, so at least people can be able to have shilling to buy the small small things. Otherwise, you know you will exclude seventy five percent of the people not to buy anything. Now, issue of. Uh, Land, so that's the second issue, right? Land survey. I think the land ownership, if I'm not mistaken, I, this is not my expertise. Land ownership is the same thing everywhere you go to Somalia. We have clans, we have clans, and every clan lives in that area, and that area is normally for the clans. It's, it's their, their grazing area. And then if they want farms, that's their farm. Uh, and, and so it's individual, individuals. Uh, uh, mostly it's uh, the, the head of the group or the, the elder that will decide or the elders that will normally decide. But mo mo modern methodology teaches us that we should register people on, the, on their names and all that. And I think it's not only Somaliland, everybody is, is uh, doing that. Now, uh, oh, girls' education is extremely important, young lady. Girls' education is important now. Um, we are, uh, well, we are behind. We are very behind. We are very behind in the sense that we are behind in, in all schools. Most of our schools are managed by NGOs because of the problems that Somalia had. We did not have the capacity to do that. But it's now that we started to uh, repossessing the government, government schools. And then part of that will be to encourage girls to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to enroll. Uh, by uh, making available the facilities that girls need. Uh, we normally don't separate them, but uh, in some, ca some cases they are. Uh, so it is it's that big problem, a uh, big problem of not having the capacity uh, to build schools. Uh, I think uh, uh, the government has just taken over about 30 or so schools in, around, in and around Mogadishu. Uh, but everywhere, uh, ha curriculum harmonization is the first thing that, uh, that the minister was, was telling me, that first thing that we have to do. And we are working on that across the, 
across the country. Now, my media, my media, I have a media discussion at the end of every month uh, for transparency reasons. Uh, it is called Meet Your Minister Day. So at the end of every month, the whole media will come and, and we will discuss what we did that month, how much money we collected, what we have done, what we have done with it, uh, both inside, outside, they have questions. And so it is a great day, everybody looks forward to it. Uh, and so we, we still continue, we still continue. As soon as I go back, I will have the media day, media day, and if there is any special event, I also do my media day, meet your minister day. Uh, so it is, it is something that other ministers also do. It is part of the transparency. It is part of uh, bring your people together with you. They have to travel with you. And if you want them to travel with you and build the nation with you, they have to understand what you are doing. And you have to, they have to understand and they have to sign to it that what you are doing is correct. And we have a website. If you go to our website, it's not, it's not one of the best ones, but we have tried uh, for our website in the, in the Ministry of Finance to be interactive enough for people to, uh, to, uh, to, to respond. So, so I, I find that very, very useful, and other people also find it very useful. So I think we have time for two more extremely brief questions because the minister has another meeting that he has to go to. Uh, this lady has been waiting very patiently up here, and then, and then we'll give you the last word. Yes. Thank you. Hi, Andrea Shalal with Reuters. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about emerging markets and emerging economies in the context of the U.S.-China trade war, in the context of the sort of uncertainty that's happening. The IMF this week said that it sees some kind of spillover effect from these trade wars into emerging economies. There's been a lot of jockeying for position, you know, especially by China in Africa as such. Can you just say a word about your perspective from where you sit on the state of the global economy and whether you think... Um, the you know leadership in in advanced economies are are behaving prudently yes. with these kind of tariff wars that are uh, yes. hurting the U.S. Uh, hurting the global economy. Okay, very good. And it's the last word. Thank you. Uh, my name is Deirdre Le Pen. I'm an international development uh, expert, and I was posted by the UN to Somalia for three and a half years before the fall of Mogadishu. Okay. So um, I have a question, uh, given your emphasis on investment and also your experience in agriculture. Uh, some very successful areas of production in Somalia have been bananas and grapefruit, and also livestock marketing. And there's also been on and off uh, oil exploration in parts of the country. I wondered what your vision for those three areas of development might be. OK, so thank you very much. Now, let me start with the emerging markets and trade, particularly, and, and, uh, and what is happening in the world. Uh, we are kind of. Uh, in the Horn of Africa, they are very far from where big things are happening. Uh, I, I am, I'm, I'm pleased to say that we, are, we have a major project with the World Bank now starting called Regional Integration and Economic Cooperation. And trade is part of it, very important element. And uh, we have five countries, and we have major projects that will link the four countries, uh, trade to the ocean, where they use our, our, our shores. And we will have the roads and all that. And uh, being traders ourselves, we are lo looking forward to that. I think it's about time that we started uh, looking internally, trade internally. You know, we look at overseas outside the, uh, outside the, uh, outside the oceans, but uh, now we are looking internally. Uh, I have not seen anything that uh, is, is spilled over to us from ma major tra trade wars. We are also signing into WTO ourselves, and, and, and the, the, the neighboring countries, they may, may have already done it. Uh, so I think we, uh, there will be more trade in this world than, than less. Uh, uh, my, my view is that we, we should open our doors to, uh, it should be demand-driven, demand, demand and supply uh, should, should, be, should be the guide. Uh, on the issue of uh, investment, yes. Uh, yes, investment in those areas are very important. Uh, I can tell you, whatever you saw then, uh, the, we, we used to produce bananas and, and, and send it outside, also produce sugar. And they, we also send it to our to, to neighboring countries. 
uh, those are now uh, uh, not, not functioning, dysfunctional. Uh, the factories that you saw at that time are, are no longer working. Uh, so we are, it will be part of the rehabilitation of this, and, and livestock, as you said, is also a very important component of our economy. Uh, it is part of our emphasis when, when the debt is relieved. It, it, it's going to be part of our uh, major projects that we are waiting uh, funding from the international community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please uh, join me in thanking Dr. Bellet in the. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.